Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome to Resilience in Times of Uncertainty, a webinar co-hosted by Toastmasters International and the American Psychological Association. My name is John Lurquin, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Director with Toastmasters International. I am also a longtime member of the APA. I earned my PhD in Cognitive Psychology from the University of Colorado and conducted laboratory research for about 10 years before joining Toastmasters. So I'm very excited to see these two organizations come together on this topic. Thank you for joining us today. We will have a designated period at the end of the session for questions you might have for the panelists. Please submit your questions to the Q&A pane. With so many attendees, we may not be able to answer all of your questions, but we will do our best. Thank you in advance for your patience. Feel free to use the chat pane to connect with one another during the webinar. Now, please know that our team will only answer questions posted in the Q&A pane. Thanks for being polite and courteous to your fellow attendees. This webinar is being recorded today and you will receive an email in a few days with a link to the recording. Before we get started, let's gauge how much we all need today's topic. In a second, you'll see a poll question on your screen. Please take a moment to answer. What best describes how you view the past year? Less stressful than I expected? It was neutral, no more or less stressful than in prior years? One of the more stressful years of my life? And then finally, the most stressful year of my life? I'll leave it open for just a few more seconds and then we'll take a look at the results. You should see the results on your screen now. And, and these are no surprise, given what all of us have went through over the last year and continue to go through. It makes sense that a lot of our responses are on the stressful side of those options. Let's launch one more question. One more question to see how, how many of us felt some positives over the past year. You should see the question on your screen. Despite the past year, did you experience any unexpected positive outcomes? A few more seconds. And this is amazing, but also not a surprise, right? We acknowledge that even though over the past year, it was stressful, one of the more stressful or even most stressful years of our life, we still recognize and are aware of, of positive outcomes, positivity in the world during a time, even a time like that uh, during 2020. Now, I have the honor of introducing our webinar moderator, Dilip Abhisekara. Dilip grew up in Sri Lanka and moved to the United States for his higher education. After earning a PhD in chemistry, he worked for 12 years as an industrial scientist, during which time he joined Toastmasters and discovered he had a talent for public speaking and training. He was twice a finalist in the Toastmasters World Championship of Public Speaking Contest, and has served as Toastmasters International President, the organization's highest leadership role. He also earned Toastmasters accredited speaker designation in countering a call to ministry. He earned a Master of Divinity degree and now serves as a full-time pastor of a church in Pennsylvania. Thank you, Dilip, for being with us today. Thank you, John. I am happy to be here with our panel of experts. I'm excited to introduce our first panelist, Mana K. Ali Carter. Dr. Ali Carter is a psychologist at MedStar National Rehabilitation Hospital, serving adults with various co congenital and or traumatic 
physical and medical conditions. She is the attending psychologist on spinal cord injury and disease unit, director of training for rehabilitation and pain psychology fellowship and co-chair of the equity committee. She also is an adjunct professor at Bowie State University Department of Psychology and assistant professor at Georgetown University Department of Rehabilitation Medicine. Her research, clinical and advocacy efforts have focused on the intersection of marginalized communities and poor health out outcomes. Welcome, Lisa. The second expert with us today is Lisa Brown. Dr. Brown is a professor, director of the trauma department program at Palo Alto University and an adjunct clinical professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. Her clinical and research focus is on trauma, resilience, and aging. As a researcher, she is actively involved in developing and evaluating health programs used nationally and internationally. Drafting recommendations aimed at protecting vulnerable individuals and communities, facilitating participation of key stakeholders and improving access to resources and services. Welcome. Now I have the pleasure of introducing Charles S. S. Gates. Charles is an entrepreneur, coach, trainer, MC, and transformational speaker. He takes his audience and clients from mundane to magnificent using his top hat leadership philosophy. His high energy presentations and workshops are fun, in your face, and memorable. He has been featured in many publications and local television shows, serving on the boards of a handful of community-based nonprofits. Charles is also a past district director and regional advisor for Toastmasters International. Welcome, Charles. And last but definitely not least, my colleague and friend, Pat Johnson. Pat has spoken in a long list of countries around the world as a keynote speaker and educator over the past 20 years. She was the international president of Toastmasters International in 2010, 2011, and currently serves in the role of Toastmasters region advisor. She's passionate about her business, Pat Johnson and Associates, where she coaches leaders to become their authentic selves. Pat is also an affiliate coach at Accomplishment Coaching, has a world-class speaker coach certification, and is a member of the International Coaching Federation. Well, welcome, Pat, and welcome all panelists. It is a privilege for me to interact with each of you distinguished panelists. We have a worldwide audience, as I look at my monitor, I see that we have 3,000 already, but we have up to 12,000 who have registered for this. And we are addressing a topic of importance for all people in every country, resilience in times of uncertainty. Like the rest of the world, you also have been affected by the uncertainty of our times and you have endured. There's a reason why you're here. Tell us what motivates you to approach each day with a positive attitude. Please kick off this webinar with a positive mantra or quote that you think we can all use during these times. So let me just start off by asking Dr. Lisa Brown if she would kick this off. Yes, good morning, Dilla. Thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today and have an opportunity to speak with you and, and speak with the other panelists. I, every day I get up and I remind myself that it's a fresh start, it's a new day, and that I get to decide how I want to spend my day and what's of importance to me. And as I make those types of decisions, typically I think about what do I have control over and what don't I have control over? And I try to really direct my energy towards activities that I have some level of control over 
because those will yield the best outcome. So every day is a new day. I don't have to wait till the first of the year. I don't have to wait till a Monday. Every morning when I get up is another day to actually do my work and to figure out where I can make an impact. Every day is a new opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Uh, let's go to Dr. Ali Carter. Sure, good morning, everyone. And I just wanna echo Dr. Brown's sentiment. I'm grateful to be here and excited about this collaboration. Um, every morning when I wake up, I take a deep breath and I just say the words, I am here. Um, and this propels me toward gratitude because of course it reminds me that I'm alive, but also it helps me cultivate some self-compassion that I take with me throughout the day. I find myself just stretched in so many ways. I'm a mom of two little kids, a psychologist, a teacher, a supervisor, a daughter, a friend. I mean, I can go on and on and that can be overwhelming. It can be hard to be all of those things all of the time. And so saying I am here just really allows me to focus on the role that's in front of me in that moment and put everything in the background. It also doesn't come with any qualifiers. So I am here. There's no pressure to that statement. There's no rules. You know, because I find that there's no blueprint on how to be the best me during the pandemic. Um, there's no level of perfect functioning. Your best just ebb and flows throughout the day, throughout the days. So for example, me, when, I'm have, when I have the flu, I'm a very different parent than when I don't have the flu, right? But that doesn't mean I'm a bad parent when I have the flu, it just looks different. So I am here no strings attached, just being present and grateful. Thank you. Words of advice, words of wisdom. Thank you, Dr. Ali Carter. Let's go to a distinguished Toastmaster, Pat Johnson. Thank you, Dilip, and welcome everyone. I am uh, similar to the previous two speakers in that when I wake up, the first thing I love to do is take a deep cleansing breath and just feel gratitude and honor that I get to live another day. I also have a quotation, if I can share it from Patanjali, that reminds me of a, some purpose in life. And Patanjali, a very wise Indian sage uh, said, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your conscious expands in every direction and you find yourself in a new, great and wonderful world. And that is how I would love to live every day. Oh, that is awesome. Thank you, Pat. Thank you very much. And let's go to another distinguished Toastmaster, Charles Gates. Charles, tell us. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and all of you out there. I, like the ladies who spoke previously, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is give gratitude. But I do that through an exercise called four, seven, eights, where I breathe in for four, one, two, three, four, hold it for seven and breathe out for eight. So I'm giving my body that cleanse for the day and getting me ready and recharged for the morning. And I am not a coffee drinker. Therefore, my motivation is in the broom handle, which I will share later in this webinar. But I will tell you, it is a session that I call housework. And my quote that I like to live by is, every day is a choice. I don't know who made that quote, not interested. But the point is, every day we wake up, every moment of every minute is a choice. We can either choose to have a good day or we can choose to have a bad day. I choose to have a good day every day. Dilla? Charles, that's fantastic. Reminds me of a quote by Abraham Lincoln who said, we can be as happy as we make up our minds to be. So thank you all for, for that positive start to our webinar. And I hope that our listeners will take these positives and the ideas that you're going to share in the next 45 minutes as something that they can use to 
live with, to, to find positive ways of handling the challenges of the moment and share with their families and friends. So you are not simply talking to 3.3 thousand listeners, you're also talking indirectly to their families and friends. Now, let me go straight to the title of, your, of our topic today. The focus is resilience. And we have an expert in our panel who actually has specialized in that area, among other areas, and that's Dr. Lisa Brown. So Dr. Brown, how do you define resilience? What does it look like from your perspective? That's a great question. Um, for resilience, everybody's going to be resilient in a slightly different way. Um, I'm speaking to you right now from California. And I'm gonna use three different types of trees as examples of resilience. We typically think of resilience as bouncing back from a traumatic experience. And so I always think of a palm tree and how the palm tree will bend in the wind. And then as the wind abates, the palm tree will come back up again. And so that's one model of resilience. And that's the most common model that's presented in the media. But there are other models as well. So we have redwood trees as well in California. And redwood trees are massive. They're the biggest trees on earth. And that those trees, when the wind blows, they do not move in the wind. They stay straight and tall. There's no bending. They're not uprooted. They're very, very stable. And then we have another type of tree in our state, which is a cypress tree. And cypress trees, when the wind blows them, they reconfigure, they change their shape. They adjust to the wind over the course of time. Some will lose their branches. Some will grow much shorter so that they don't get toppled over. And what happens is, is that over the course of time, some of these trees end up looking very sculptural in nature. They look very, very beautiful. Each of us has a different personality. So each of us has a different kind of resilience. So if we look at our coworkers, if we look at our family members, there should be no judgment involved because based on our hard wiring, based on our personality, the type of resilience that will show under difficult circumstances will vary from person to person. And resilience will also change over the course of time. I know that with a pandemic, one of the challenges is, is that when we first started out with this pandemic, it was presented as a two week, maybe a three week, a four week situation. And so we were all thinking like runners where we're going to do a sprint and then be done with the race. And then they said, no, 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 this is going to actually be more of a marathon. And so initially we kind of were working from the palm tree perspective where it would bounce back. And when we realized that it was a marathon, people started having problems figuring out what kind of a tree they were, what kind of resiliency would they show and really needing to take the time to reflect on what kind of skills and resources and social networks they had. But now we're at a point where we recognize that we're not actually even in a marathon, we're an ultra marathon. And so more than likely this will cause all of us to do a little bit of reconfiguration like those cypress trees where we need to adjust to the new normal, where we need to make some changes. So there's basically three models of resilience and the one that's right for you is the one that you're currently showing. So if you would like, you have an opportunity right now in the chat to indicate what kind of tree you might be. If you're a cypress tree or a redwood tree or a palm tree and what kind of resiliency you're showing during the COVID outbreak. Wow, that's a wonderful visual model. Am I a palm tree? or redwood or cypress. Uh, Dr. Brown, let me just ask a, a question to elaborate a little bit. Can we be a palm tree one time and a redwood another time and a cypress a different time? That's a great question. <clears throat> I think we're predisposed to kind of lean toward one tree more often than not. You know, all of us have personality traits, which are fairly stable across the lifespan. So we all have real strengths that we've all developed as we've gone into adulthood. And those strengths tend to be basically demonstrated in sort of the same way over and over and over again, because it's where we're most comfortable. However, 
to your point, I think that it's something where, you know, given the nature of the COVID outbreak, that we probably all started out as palm trees, thinking we would bounce back pretty quickly from this. And then as we readjusted to our understanding that this will be a longer type of situation we were contending with, the type of tree we are might change as well. So you're right, there might be some adjustments that happen over the course of time. Thank you so much. That's a, that's a wonderful way to think about it. I'm going to ask our Toastmasters present here because you are seeing how people are responding to the challenge of the times uh, in your Toastmaster clubs as they gather together. What are you seeing? What are your observations as you see Toastmasters deal with this in their club meetings, in their interactions with others, as well as their understandings of, of themselves. Uh, Pat, would you lead off on that? Thanks, Stella. A very interesting question, because as I was listening to Dr. Brown explain the trees, I was actually relating to my Toastmasters experience globally and how we really have adapted. And some people have uh, been challenged to adapt. So some of us went online right quickly when COVID happened and found out that, wow, I can be this morning in China or South Africa or Bahrain or uh, Chicago, Illinois. I can be wherever I want simply by sitting down in a screen, clicking a link and being there. And so those of us that are Cypress trees got super excited about that and and uh, very well adapted to that experience and built networks, excitement. And some of people have brought the idea of, oh, this is a great way to research ideas to bring back to my home club. Other people joined those groups around the world and now feel part of that community there and have really built ties. So I, I think that our, our different types of trees are taking roots in all different ways around the globe when it comes to Toastmasters. But I think that finding that connection when we get into a community where we have a similar interest, where you find people of all different personalities, background, education, style of communicating, but we have that commonality that we're there to support one another's highest and best. And when you go into that environment, wherever you are in the world, it's really difficult not to be raised up to be the best that you can be that day, simply by the environment. And that's certainly something that I've experienced for years in this organization. And one of the reasons why I've stayed so involved is that that positive influence, a great dear, uh, aunt of mine used to tell me that you'll be known by the company you keep. Mm -hmm. And so I always think that I'm in really good company when I'm with happy, fulfilled and learning people. Great observations. And I'm so glad that you are living what you're talking about, Pat. I can't be around you without having a smile on my face because you radiate that joy. I'm going to ask Charles, in your experience, and since we have a large Toastmaster audience listening in, what have you seen about the resilience shown in Toastmaster activities? Well, I'll tell you, Bill, of piggybacking on Dr. Brown's analogy of the trees, I never thought it quite that thought about it quite that way. I've always looked at resiliency. When I think of that word, I think of insects and ants in particular. If you cut off one leg, they, they don't stop. You cut off another leg, they keep coming. You cut off a third leg, they'll keep coming. You cut up all the legs off and they'll sit there and they will roll to get to their destinations. I look at Toastmasters in the same way as an insect. We may take a licking, but we keep on ticking. And to Pat's point, I too have taken advantage of this virtual opportunity to travel all over the world in the comfort of my own home. Sitting down here with a click of a button, I can be anywhere in the world in a moment's notice. But what I'm finding when I'm speaking to these different members is we're all handling these, this, this challenging time in different ways. Some of us are feeling lonely where Toastmasters is that outlet that they're looking so forward to going to. 
And then there are some who are already members of multiple clubs. And now that this virtual world has opened up, they just cannot get enough. And I will tell you, I am one of those people. I cannot get enough. And when I tell you, and I'll tell you, when I do happen to visit these other clubs, knowing that some of these members are going through the different challenges, I don't want to visit to observe. I want to visit to participate, evaluate, speak, do something to uplift and encourage those that happen to be in attendance because you don't know everyone that's there. You don't know the challenges and the, the things they're going through in life. So I try to myself lift them up in any which way I could because words are so powerful and not just the words, but the language that you're putting behind those words, the energy that you're bringing into them. As I like to share with people, gestures bring energy into your words. So if you're telling someone to bring the bada bing, the bada boom, you got to bring that bada bing, the bada boom, and just to make them feel good. They may be in the dumps. Life may be getting them down. They may feel beat up. They may feel like pop by the sailor. I've stood all I can stand. I can't stand no more. But they will get up if we can lift them up. Because each and every one of us wants someone, whether we admit it or not, we want someone to lift us up in times of hurt and in times of strife. So that is my message to us in Toastmasters and everyone listening here. You may be going through some challenging times. We know that. We get that. But there is someone in your corner that can lift you up to say, hey, you can do this. Go. Wow. I feel so lifted up just listening to you, Charles. Thank you. Thank you. Both Pat and Charles referred to the environment in Toastmasters, which is positive and uplifting, purposefully. That's part of the mission of a club. So I'm going to ask Dr. Ali Carter to chime in here because Dr. Carter, in my conversations with you earlier, you mentioned the importance of, of having a system that supports the people who are in it. Could you elaborate about how an organization or system can be set up to enable people to be resilient? Sure. Um, so before I jump into that, I just want to piggyback off what the others were saying. Um, you know, I think that we have a tendency to think very dichotomously about um, adjectives. We're winning, we're failing. It's good, it's bad. We are strong, we are weak, right? And I think it's important to remember that we can be both because in my clinical practice and in my professional relationships, I often find that people feel anger and sadness and worry during difficult times, and they perceive that as an indicator that they're not resilient. And that's not true. So I just wanna encourage people um, to think about this, uh, these concepts as in a non-dichotomous way, that you can feel worry and sadness and all of these things and still be resilient. You know, inherent in these concepts, resilience and burnout and self-care and all these things that we are going to talk about today, it sort of places the onus on the response, the, the, the onus and responsibility on the individual, right? So if I'm not resilient, it's a problem with me. I'm not doing something right. If I'm burnt out, I can't withstand these challenges, what's going on with me. And so when I was talking to uh Dillup in previous conversations, I said, I want to open up that conceptualization a little bit more that you can also look at resilience and burnout and as a system, as the system has a responsibility to, to help with this. For example, you can just take something like a working mom. Is a working mom, is it her fault that she's pulled in different directions or is it a system issue that leave policies aren't really shaped and formed for the person's lifestyle. So in my current work, um, you know, we really, when, when the pandemic first happened, I'll give you some background. I work in a hospital. We work directly with patients who have tested positive for COVID-19. And so it is a, a tense environment, particularly when the pandemic first happened. And so to combat the healthcare workers getting burnt out, we looked at the system and said, well, what can we do to support the healthcare workers, us? So we looked at current policies such as telework, which we did not have telework days or documentation work from home days. We implemented those. 
we formed smaller teams so I can have a day off and my teammate will cover. We made intentional time for lunch break. So we changed the system to support the person versus asking the individuals to raise up to the occasion or be better, right? Because, you know, it, this is sort of this, the, I think it can be sort of stigmatizing this idea of burnout in self care. So I would just encourage people to look at both to look at the dynamic relationship between people and the system that they're in. Thank you, Dr. Carter, Ali Carter. And you have actually some specialization in the area of dealing with people who are suffering burnout. Can you tell us what burnout is and why it might be detrimental to us? Sure. So the World Health Organization um, actually classifies this in their ICD, International Disease Classification System. And they recognize it as an occupational phenomenon. They're very clear to say this is not a medical condition. So it's a syndrome that's conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that hasn't been successfully managed. But again, remember, as, as I use these words, there's an undertone that it falls on the individual. So I want people to think differently from that. But it's characterized by three dimensions. So feeling um, depletion or exhaustion, increased mental distance from one's job or feeling negatively or more cynical about one's job, and just reduced professional efficacy. And so, you know, burnout manifests differently for different people. For some people, it can manifest as in their emotions or moods. So they may feel worry or fear, panic, sadness, irritability, pessimism, loss of enjoyment and pleasurable activities. It can manifest through cognitive function or thinking ability. So for me, this is how burnout tends to manifest. I make more mistakes. I have trouble remembering. I feel stuck or in a fog sometimes. For others, it may manifest in your body. So aches and pains or digestive problems, tension, sleep disturbance, or it could manifest in your behavior. So you might notice that you might be using more substances or you're working too fast. You're not pacing as well as you usually do. You might be overworking or withdrawing. And similar to resilience, it's different for different people. So it's important to keep a pulse on all of these domains to see how it might be manifesting for you. I also like to think about burnout amplifiers. Uh, one of the things that I always say is all the hurts hurt together. So if you are feeling chronically stressed or disengaged from work, that's likely gonna impact other areas of your life or in the opposite direction that other areas of your life may make burnout more probable at work. So I call these burnout amplifiers and that can be relationship discord, uh, lower self-esteem or self-efficacy, passive coping, poor health behaviors, low job satisfaction. So it's not something that you can contain in a bubble usually. So that's one more thing to be mindful of. Wow, what a lot of useful information you've shared with us, Dr. Ali Carter, thank you. No problem. Associated with burnout are feelings of isolation. And we are in a unique time in world history where people have been told to separate from each other, to keep a social distance if you're out and about, to stay in your home if possible, not to mix and mingle, as a pastor, I have to ask my congregation to wear a mask when they come and not to gather in groups. This is all antithetical to the human desire to be in relationship. So I'd like to find out what you're observing and what your experience is in overcoming what can be a very depressive situation. Charles, would you share with us some things that you have done to overcome this because you like the rest of the several thousand people listening on this have had to face it. But I see the power and the energy you have, the positive attitude. So you must be doing something that is able to countermand 
the, the power that this isolation can cause. Well, Bill, I'm looking at it from, through the eyes of a community activist. I've been a community activist most of my adult life. And I do realize that there are people who were lonely before the pandemic. This episode has exacerbated that, that situation. But what I, what I would recommend to everyone out there is get to know the people around you, the people in your neighborhoods, the people within your circle of influence. Reach out to them more so now than ever before because they, chances are they're not gonna tell you that they're lonely. In fact, I will tell you in one of my Toastmaster meetings very recently, one of the more uh, senior members shared with us that she was lonely. And we can see it, we can hear it in a voice, we can see it in our eyes. So we should be taking it upon ourselves to not wait until they let us know that they're lonely. Even though we may not be able to see face to face or shake hands or to hug each other, which we're not able to do right now, there's no reason we can't walk two doors, two houses away from us, depending on where you live, in your own neighborhood, in your own community, to find those people who are lonely. And you don't have to shake hands. We don't have to hug each other, but simply let them know that you care. Maya Angelou once said, people will forget what you say, they will forget what you do, but they will never forget how you made them feel. If we reach out and touch people, not physically, but virtually, or however you need to do it, it can mean so much to people, but we have to take the first step, not letting them, not waiting for them to respond to us. We've got to reach out to them. And I will tell you, from a community standpoint, it is rampant in our communities. People are lonely. They are depressed. The anxiety is through the roof. They're stressed out because of work. It's incumbent upon each one of us who are able. We may say, well, you know, I don't have the time. That's an excuse. Think about this. There are 24 hours in every person's day. How we choose to spend those 24 hours is what counts making excuses, procrastinating, doing this, doing things that are not productive are counterintuitive. That extra time that we have, however you fit it in, put it in your calendar, I'm going to walk down the street and say hello to my neighbor. That can make their day. In some cases, that can make their week or their month because you're the first person to reach out to them to let them know that you care. So caring to me, Dillip, is number one. And that can be shown in in a variety of different ways. We don't have, pick up the phone. There's no one on this call that doesn't have one of these sitting on their hip somewhere. Reach out and touch someone, send someone a nice text message, let them know you're thinking about them. And that's, sometimes it just takes those little things to make so much of a difference in a person's life. And I don't think we do that enough, but we need to look inside of ourselves and say, you know what, if I was in this situation, what would I want? I would want someone to reach out to me as well. Dilla Charles, thank you. You've thrown the gauntlet to all our listeners and to us. Get out there and share your love with others. You know, there's an old saying, if you want friends, first be a friend to others. And your message is coming loud and clear and it's something we all need to hear from time to time. Now, Pat, anything you'd like to reflect on as uh, we talk about helping others and you as a, as a Toastmasters global leader know all about this. You've been to many different countries, interacted with different cultures. What are some observations you've made about how we can help others through this time period? Thanks again, Dilip, for that. And thank you, Charles, for your inspirational words and the wisdom from our two doctors uh, previously that made me very thoughtful. And it brought back a memory. Um, not many people know this, but when I was in my 20s, I was suicidal. I was so depressed and felt so isolated and lonely and um, really uh, very alone in the world, having no support around me before Toastmasters days. And I can touch that feeling. And I, when my single friends call me and say I'm lonely, I am quickly out of my house to go and visit or to spend time on the phone. I also discovered that by being who I am at the authentic heart level is what, is what I can bring to the friends and the people around me. So I love to bake. And we can look at these 
times in isolation and go, oh, 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 that's not a good thing to want to do these days because you bake it and you eat it. But Nigel and I at Christmas time baked up tins of goodies and we went around our community to the doors and met the seniors that were lonely, isolated from their families, and we gave them a bucket of home-baked goods. And people were, we, they'd meet us weeks after and they're still smiling going, oh, I love those shortbread or, oh, I love those sweet things you gave us, whatever they were. And so it was so simple. It fed my heart and soul but it also let them know that somebody knew they were there, that they weren't invisible and that somebody was there. And we just said, if you need anything, call us or knock on our door. And subsequently people have walked by when we've been out in the yard and they wave and greet, greet us and, and let us know that they're doing fine. And everybody in our, our community now has posted signs in their windows that say that they're okay or just to, so that as people go by, we all know that we're doing well. I also have single friends that are living alone and uh, we just make steady calls, uh, check-in calls to make sure everything's okay. Because I went, you know, I was alone for many years and I often thought I could die and nobody would miss me. What if nobody phoned to check and I was lying on the floor? And we don't plan those things, but, and they can happen even without a pandemic, but it was just a real awareness of the isolation that we feel. And when we don't have people coming in and out of our homes the way we normally do, or showing up to events, we need to show up for the people in our lives and just bring your heart and soul uh, to what you wanna do. And that'll be just perfect for the day, in my opinion. Pat, what a wonderful story. You've created so many ideas, I'm sure, for many of our listeners. And that causes me to share this very short story with you. In my community, there are a number of elderly people and some are in nursing homes. And as you know, in nursing homes, they do not allow any visitors. And some have been confined there for a while now, for several months. In my church, the congregational care team was wondering what to do. I mean, we can do things like making phone calls, as Charles suggested, sending cards. But we wondered, is there anything else we can do to tell them that they are important to us? So a couple of members came up with this great idea. They took a couple of posters and wrote in bold, large, bold letters, we miss you. We love you. We are praying for you. And what they did was they called the nursing home in advance and said, we want to do a window, window visit. A window visit is where you don't come into the, through the door, but you ask them to come to a window, open window. I mean, there's a glass there, but you can look through the glass and they may not be able to hear you when you're saying something, but you can hold up that poster so when they come to the window, a whole bunch of us are there with posters <laughs> assuring them that they are miss, missed, that we love them, that they're important to us and that they're in our thoughts and prayers. And we have heard so many good things about when we follow up with a phone call, they say, you made my day. Just like what you were talking about, Pat. We are only limited by our creativity to reach out and touch and make a difference for others. So having said that about loneliness and isolation. I want to ask Dr. Brown if, if you would elaborate a little about how loneliness and isolation can affect our physical health. Why is this a dangerous condition? It, it is a dangerous condition. Um, I really resonated with each of you, uh, Charles and Pat and uh, Dilip, the story that you told, the stories that you told about your own experiences. Um, I think it's very regrettable that the term social distancing was coined. It really should be that we wanna have physical distancing and social connectedness, that we don't want to have social distancing. That is not what we really want. We want physical distancing. 
And I think that um, we have uh, two different syndromes that occur that are, that are documented. One of them is um, failure to thrive. And that's usually with children where we know that a combination of medical conditions, but also again, um, lack of engagement, lack of contact with others. And we also have geriatric failure to thrive, which is on the other end of the continuum. And that primarily pertains to older adults. And it's very, very real. I think that your idea uh, to live about going to the nursing home and doing a window visit is really good. That people need to have that contact. Like Pat talked about, would anybody know if I disappeared? Would anybody recognize? I think making people feel seen feel connected is something that we can do. Uh, even with limited resources, we can find ways to reach out. Um, I know that in my neighborhood, um, it's, it's a chance sometimes to take a look at your neighbors again through fresh eyes, that, that we, we see them sometimes and we're not really engaged with them in a meaningful way. Um, we had uh, one woman in my neighborhood who every day she puts out a new joke of the day. And so when I'm out walking my dog, I get a new joke of the day. And it's very, it's amazing just that one small little joke. It's just enough where it cheers me up on my walk and makes me feel connected to my neighborhood at large. We had another woman earlier this uh, year who took a picture book, a child's picture book, and then she took the pages and posted them on little sticks throughout the neighborhood so that families who have children could actually walk through the neighborhood and read the story. It was like, it was like a hunt to find the next, next page in the book. And they had a little map that would guide them. But all these things to build connectivity, to offset the physical distancing and the damage that can cause to our health. Um, I know one of, the, one of the bonuses of belonging to an organization like Toastmasters or to a church or some religious organization where you meet regularly is that I can see somebody and I can say, oh, you know, you look a little off. Maybe you should go see a doctor. Maybe you should go, maybe can I help you do something that we can recognize in others more immediately what's happening in their lives, even through Zoom. Sometimes we can sense where somebody's not bringing their A game and that we can jump in to provide some support. So what Pat was talking about in terms of hearing people's voices, that they sounded a little, you can, you can tell when someone's distressed. And I think this is a time now, depending upon your situation and depending upon your circumstances, to make a little extra effort to reach out to others. It'll benefit you as well as the person that you're reaching out to. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Brown. What you said reminds me of a quote I read somewhere that service is the price we pay for the space we occupy on this earth. Service, but makes a difference to others. We've been talking about reaching out to others, but now let's talk about self-care, about taking the time to care for our own selves. So I'm gonna turn this over to the two doctors because self-care is something that I think most, most of us grow up not realizing what self-care is and how we can care for ourselves and that there's nothing ignoble about caring for yourself. That if you don't care for yourself, you are probably not going to be able to care for others. Would you all address this? Uh, I'll start with Dr. Ali Carter. What is self-care? Why is it important? And what are some things that we can do? Go ahead, Dr. Carter, Ali Carter. Thank you. So self-care is an intentional and deliberate activity to take care of our physical, cognitive, spiritual, and psychological health. And so I just wanna underscore intentional and deliberate because it never feels convenient or easy to take time out for yourself. So if you are waiting to wake up and say, yep, today feels like the day, I don't, I think you, you, you know, we're all working, we're all busy, we're, we're all pulled in different directions. I think you'll be waiting for a long time, right? So you just have to do it. You have to be intentional and deliberate. You know, some of my patients, particularly during the pandemic, they come to me and they say, hey, tell me, tell me how to take care of myself. And then I tell them, well, I don't know. And they're like, well, you're the doctor. And I'm like, but you're the expert on you. 
you know what works for you. You have tools, you have strengths, you have abilities. Let's sit there and process this a little bit. So I think a part of this process is realizing that yes, it's nice to have tools, but you also likely have tools, abilities, and strengths already. So instead of recreating the wheel every time, because that just feels guilt shaming and like a lot of pressure to also look to yourself and think about what's worked in the past to help me get through a challenging time. Particularly if you're, if you're on social media, you probably notice that self-care, if you ever see a meme, it's you know burning sage and doing yoga and smelling lavender and all of these very trendy, relaxing things. But that feels like a lot of pressure. So maybe self-care for you is watching reality TV or you know, reading a funny book. I mean, it just looks different for different people. Thank you, Dr. Ali Carter. You've, you've given permission to people to discover their own way of having self-care. Uh, Dr. Brown, anything to add to that? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali Carter. That was very helpful. And just to build a little bit on, on what was just shared. Um, when I was younger, um, I decided I was going to drive to a friend's house in a neighboring town. And so I made it about halfway there and I ran out of gas. And so I had to call my parents and they had to come and get me out of that situation. They had to pick up gas and help me get fuel into the car. And I think that in some ways, self-care is a little bit like having a car, you know, that we're bodies are like having a car. And that because self-care self is oftentimes, you know, going to sleep and having a good sleep schedule, eating well, you know, getting outside and having exercise, maintaining contact with others, doing things that seem very basic and oftentimes very simple. And as Dr. Ali Carter pointed out, each of us have our own kind of go-to list that work best for us. The challenge is, is that because these things seem so basic and we don't make time for them because we're stretched too thin, that oftentimes we sort of minimize the true benefits that we can yield from having engaged in these practices. So for example, if I go to sleep on time, I'm keeping gas in my car. If, if I'm connecting regularly with friends, I have windshield wiper fluid to make sure that I can see out through my windows and make those connections. If, if I'm trying to, um, you know, get outside and have more exercise. You know, that's like having oil in my car so that my body doesn't seize up because I don't have oil, you know, keeping everything lubricated and running properly. So I think just like we care for our car, we have to think about caring for ourselves in the same way. And as Dr. Ali Carter pointed out, we have to figure out like, do we need a premium gas or will a regular gas do? Are we diesel? So each of us has to find our own special way of fueling our cars, of maintaining our cars. And the car really is sort of a symbol for our bodies and, and how we best can function during this time. But self-care is very important. When in doubt, put it on your calendar. If I have it listed on my calendar, the likelihood of it happening goes up tenfold, tenfold. Wow. What? I love your analogies. Dr. Ali Carter, you were about to say something? Yeah, as, as Dr. Brown was talking, I was reflecting on my own barriers to self-care because I have barriers as well. Even though I'm a psychologist, I'm not immune uh, to putting self-care last sometimes. And so one of my biggest barriers is what I would say is negative self-talk. I find myself... Um, creating these obstacles, uh, like only I can do this. I can't take a break. Like I'm not doing enough at work. So a part of self-care I think is also taking a pulse when you're thinking around it and trying to challenge any negative self-talk that will not give you permission to put yourself first, right? Uh, one of the analogies, you know, I, I'm a caregiver by nature. I have children. I'm a helper. I work in a hospital. And one of the best analogies is the airplane analogy that when you're on a plane, and if the oxygen levels drop, they tell you, 
put your mask on first before you help anyone beside you. And so this is also, I think, applicable to self-care to show up as a helper to anybody because that's my value. I have to be my best self. And so that often helps challenge the, my, my negative self-talk and help me prioritize self-care. Thank you, Dr. Ali Carter. Both of you have given us great analogies, looking after your car, in an airplane when the oxygen mass drops. These are all ways that we can visualize things and then remind ourselves to put yourself on your schedule. Don't make yourself the last. Now, there are some things that people do as a routine, a daily routine or nightly routine that helps them maintain themselves. So I'm going to ask our Toastmasters to share what routines might help them. I'll start with Charles. Charles, would you share with us how you how you take care of yourself? Maybe I'll, for, the morning. Sorry, Dilla. first of all, yeah. I love Dr. Brown's analogy about the car. If you think about it, people whose cars do not require premium gas, sometimes will put premium gas in it anyway, but yet they'll drink sodas, they'll drink all types of crazy stuff, they'll eat all kinds of junk food. So they take better care of, them car, of their cars than they do themselves. Never understood it, but we're here in this webinar to encourage everyone to take care of yourself. For myself, the first thing I do in the morning is again, doing the four, seven, eight breathing exercises. Hold, breathe in for four, hold for seven, breathe out for eight. But while I'm doing that, I'm reflecting and I'm seeking in and taking in all the gratitude of the fact that I was able to wake up this morning and that life and this day is full of choices. Right after that, my morning routine is drinking a tall glass of lemon water. It's a tall glass of lemon water to make sure I'm fleshing my body out. I'm not a coffee person by any stretch of the imagination. And then, oh, then this is all within 10 minutes time, the breathing exercise, the drinking of water. And then I jump to my broom handle and I do what I like to call housework. It's a broom handle. I took the broom off of the handle and I simply do this. And it's very simple. It only takes three minutes time. You go up, all the way up for one, out for one, down for one. Then up for two, one, two, out for two, down for two. And in fact, and all the way up to 10. And what you will do is you will work some of the muscles that we typically do not work, such as the shoulders and the upper and lower backs that we typically neglect, even for those that work out every day. We typically don't work those muscles out every day. So it's so important for you to take care of yourself through easy exercise. And everything I just did is done within the course of 10 minutes. And again, to Dr. Brown's point again, prioritizing it in your calendar. I keep a calendar every single day. I get up at pretty much the same time every day. And the first 10 minutes on that calendar is dedicated for exercise. There is no, there's, if, if I don't take phone calls, I don't check emails, I don't do social media. It is strictly for, that's Charles Gates's time in the morning. That first 10 minutes after that, then we go on to other things. But that for me is by far the most important thing, having a routine in the morning. And then if you got a smartphone, which I'm sure you do, and I'm not endorsing this, but if you have the Fitbit app, it encourages you to take 250 steps per hour. Every hour on the hour, I have an alarm that reminds me that I need to take 250 steps. How long does that take to do? It takes all of two and a half minutes of simply walking in place. And for, the, for those of you who are saying, well, I work all day. I can't do that in my office. My question to you is, why not? If they look at you like you're some kind of nutcase walking in place, so what? You know what? I'm the most fit nutcase you've ever seen. And eventually what that will do is it will encourage other people to say, you know what, this nut is walking every hour. Perhaps there's something to this because they're quite fit as a nutcase. Maybe I need to get on board with the program. So routines, having a routine and creating a habit of it. It's something you do every single day. If you know you've got a meeting at seven o'clock in the morning where you usually would have a meeting at eight, get up an hour early to make sure you get it in. Take your butt to bed early at night and get up in the morning and get it in. And just like Nike, just do it. You know? I am motivated. How about you all? <laughs> yes, and you've given a new use for broomsticks. So brooms around the world, watch out. You're going to be used more. Thank you. Pat, would you like to share something that you do that uh, you find helps you and enables you to practice self-care? 
Well, I'm almost on the other end of the spectrum of Charles, but I really need to look at my broomsticks at home in a different light. So thank you, Charles, for that. And look out everybody in close proximity when I get swinging a broomstick, because I have been called witch at times. So yeah. <laughs> we could make a game out of that. But you know, one of the things that I really love, whether I'm sad, mad, happy, glad, whatever the word is, the emotion I'm feeling, I sing. And when I'm crazy, I sing, when I'm feeling really happy and, and goofing around, I sing songs from my childhood. Uh, in languages, I don't even know what they say, but we as children learn all kinds of ditties and songs. I also have those songs that I learned when I was in uh, as a child that are worship songs that take me right to my soul and ground me. And uh, one, one song that I won't sing it, I'll spare you that, but one song is Be Still and Know That I Am God. There's something about that song that whenever I say those words, I get shivers and I am reminded to be still, that I can listen to my heart and my soul and to the world around me. The other thing that I absolutely I think we lost it there. Perhaps okay. while we're waiting for her to get back on, um, this yes. might be a good opportunity for those who are interested in chat to share the type of self-care practices you found helpful so that others can see um, what you're doing currently and how they might benefit as well. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Yes, feel free to share in chat your own practices. And now we're gonna to go to the, our time is almost up for this part of the program before we go to Q&A. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to share some silver linings or positive benefits that they have gained in this unexpected time of isolation, separation, and the stress of COVID-19. There must be some silver linings that you have found to be positive for you. Uh, would you just share and make it brief, but we'll go around the panelists. Uh, I'll start with Dr. Ali Carter, then we go to Charles, then we go to Dr. Brown, and when Pat came, comes back, hopefully she will, we'll ask her. Uh, Dr. Ali Carter. Yeah, sure, thank you. For me, one of the lessons learned is using a better discretion about what's urgent and what's not. I can be a pretty rigid person with a long to-do list. And with the pandemic just jolting our lives, I just say to myself, I don't have to do that, it's okay. My toddler throws toys on the ground, hey, it could stay there for five years. The house isn't gonna catch on fire, that's totally fine. So I've become way less rigid. So that's been a great positive uh, move for me in a different direction than what I typically am. Thank you, Dr. Caro, Ali Caro. And Charles, some silver linings that you've experienced. For me, during this pandemic, I've always been an opportunist, take advantage of every opportunity that comes your way. But during the pandemic, I've realized that I am capable of doing things that I never dreamed about before the pandemic. And most of that comes from a technology point of view. I am no technological guru by any stretch of the imagination, but this pandemic has forced me to learn things that had they, we not been in this situation, I would have never even considered even looking at, much less becoming an, an expert at. So just take advantage of all the opportunities to come your way because you never know what can happen. That's right. Amen. All of us have learned some new things, I'm sure. Dr. Brown. So I, I have experiences both inside my house and outside my house. Inside my house, I have to say that it's definitely getting a lot cleaner. And, and by that, I don't mean that I had a dirty house. It's just that I don't need to have 2,500 ballpoint pens, that two or three or four of them will be more than sufficient. So uh, many of my neighbors, including myself, we've been having free boxes that we've been placing outside of our homes. And then we put items. We're not having a garage sale. We're not selling anything. We just put the items there so that anybody that's passing through, whether they're on a bike or by foot or by car, can feel like they're invited to come in and sort through the free items that are placed 
spaced outside. And it's sort of interesting in my neighborhood that you can kind of shop your way around and, and find different things from different neighbors that are, are pretty entertaining. So my house is, is looking more orderly, but the free boxes have also resulted in me starting to get to know some of my neighbors that I previously, previously have not really fully engaged with. So I know their names. Um, it's a terrible thing to admit, but I knew a lot of dog names because I have a dog. And so I'd remember that's, you know, Stevie or that's Barky or whatever the dog's name is, but I never knew the owner's name. And now I'm really making an effort to connect the dog to the owner and the free boxes provide a venue by which that makes it easier for me to meet up with them as well as walking my own dog. Wonderful. What a way to build connections with each other and share your generosity of spirit. Thank you for sharing that. I see that Pat is unable to come back and our time is up. John Lukwin, I believe that we, that you'll take it over from here with the Q&A. Thank you, Thank, thank you for your I just want to thank the panelists for doing a fantastic job. It's been a pr privilege and pleasure for me to serve as moderator. And it absolutely has for, for us who, who have been listening over the last hour, just watching the chat and the number of comments, the, the, the level of warmth and sense of community uh, in the chat from our attendees has, has been amazing uh, to watch and follow along. Uh, we, we've received several, several Q&A questions. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, this first question is for Dr. Brown. We've received quite a few questions uh, about trees, about personality types. This is a question from Heather in the audience. How do we know which tree we are? Are there, and some follow-up questions here are about, are there any online resources, um, books or articles, anything like that that you might recommend? Hmm, that, that's a good question. I'm also going to ask uh, Dr. Ali Carter, I'm giving her a heads up to weigh in on this as well. Um, I know that, um, again, as we talked earlier, that the type of tree you are could change over the course of time. Um, sometimes I think it's, it's depending upon your family members or your close friends, sometimes it's a useful exercise to do with others and ask them, you know, what their perspective of what your coping style is or what your resilience style is. And getting some feedback from somebody that cares about you and knows you well can be really useful. Um, typically, again, when I get up in the morning and I think about, okay, it's a new day, what do I have control over? I also am thinking about, you know, how much am I capable of reconfiguring or am, am I more in a bounce back state? So it can vary from moment to moment in terms of how I'm dealing with stuff. If, um, if again, if I'm, if I'm having, you know, Dr. Ali Carter talked about having, you know, good mom days versus bad mom days where she's not as, as optimal as she'd like to be. Well, it's the same for us. It's all for all of us. We have days where we're more on than off. And I think that the on days, we might be one type of a tree. And on the off days, we might hope that we're capable of bouncing back fairly rapidly. And then the trick is, is to know the types of self-care and the types of social support that you can get to help that bounce back process. Thanks, Dr. Brown. That was, that was a great answer. Uh, you know, I don't know if I have much to add, but I think one of the most important things that we need to do is normalization. We need to normalize this ebb and flow. We need to normalize this process. We need to normalize that we evolve and change and there's good times and bad times. And I, I, I try to stay away from saying, oh, I'm having a bad day or I'm having a terrible day because what that does is it really decreases any latitude or opportunity to have a positive moment. You just throw the whole day away when you say I'm having a bad day. So instead I like to say I'm having a bad moment. And again, that's a part of the process that you should look at sort of your day and your resilience and your ability to thrive sort of like this, up and down, up and down, up and down. Most people think it's like this, just this nice, beautiful trend upward and it's not. So we all should begin to normalize the valleys, the peaks, and know that that, that is resilience. That is resilience. So thank you. Dr. Ali Carter, now that I've ha I have you, here's a question for you from an audience member. You spoke a lot about burnout and strategies to recognize burnout in yourself. Uh, this question is about recognizing burnout in other people. H how, do you, how do you do that? What, what signs are there and if you do recognize burnout in, in someone else, whether it's a roommate, a, a loved one, or a coworker, 
uh, what should you do in, in that type of situation? Thanks for that question. And it's going to be sort of a complex answer because I think it differs depending on who I'm talking about. Burnout in my children, who they can't articulate burnout, they can't articulate stress, looks a lot different than burnout in my colleagues, right? So um, it depends on what role I'm in. So at work, often I look for disengagement, I look for um, sometimes appearance. I have coworkers who on any given day, they love their hair and their colors and their makeup. And so when I notice a week has gone by and they don't have on their favorite lipstick that they wear every day, I'm like, hey, what's going on? Um, or if it's, you know, my husband, his signs are different. So I think you have to first take a pulse on the situation that you're assessing. And then again, this goes back to normalizing. Ask, ask people, how are you doing? We have to normalize that conversation and give people space to say this is, I'm not okay, right? I'm not okay, but not waddle there, right? It's okay not to be okay. And then open-ended questions are my go-to. So leaving it open for people to tell you about how they're doing and what makes them feel better. Hey, what's going on? Just checking in, how are you doing? We don't usually talk in open-ended questions. We usually say, did you have a good day? And it's kind of like, yeah, I had a good day. So instead, how was your day? That opens it up to give people time to talk and, and feel heard and share, share their spiel. So again, I think one, if I can summarize, know your, the people around you, try to look out for trends and patterns that may look a little different to be okay with just asking an open-ended question and be okay with just listening too. Sometimes we have this uh, reflex to just try to fix people's problems and that can be offensive or you can have it wrong and that's okay but just also be open to listening and hearing what they have to say so I'll, I'll open it up if anyone else has anything else to add to that recognizing burnout in others well thank you for that response sure this next question is for Charles. And this question is about online meetings. Uh, this is from a Toastmasters member. And the question is about uh, online club meetings. Uh, for those in the audience who aren't familiar, uh, there are about 17,000 Toastmasters clubs globally. And back in, in March, 2020, with the restrictions on in-person gatherings, uh, clubs had to start meeting online, which was very new for, for a lot of members. It was new for, for a lot of us. It was certainly new for me. Uh, so dealing with, with a new transition, and now since it's been a year, a lot of us are dealing with, with Zoom burnout, uh, sort of the, the other side of this. Uh, this question is about uh, motivating our members, uh, helping them be resilient through Zoom meetings, through our club meetings. Do you have any specific suggestions uh, that our clubs can include either in the meeting agenda or certain activities they can do before the club meeting or after the club meeting to deal with these issues? You know what, John, I get that question often, and this is my very simple answer. Some of our clubs lack energy. I want you to think of yourself as a guest looking at a Toastmaster club for the very first time and ask yourself, would you join your club? My answer in the many visits that I do is no, unfortunately. And I tell them that in the meetings. And I want to say that your meeting lacks energy. If you notice, I have on a red shirt. I have on a red shirt for a reason because colors bring, just like gestures bring energy into your words, colors bring energy visual. Colors are a visual energy getter. So if you're wearing this, if you're wearing something drab, and I'm not saying anyone in this panel is wearing anything drab, but if you've got too much going on, bring energy into your meetings. <laughs> All right, now you ask specifically, what can you do specifically to make your meetings more engaging? Number one, your evaluations have to be on point. Everyone is everyone that is, is in Toastmasters, Pat, Billup, they've been around, myself, we've been around for many years. We're not here for fun. We're here to learn and grow too. So if you give us a whitewash evaluation, well, that was, Charles, I couldn't find anything wrong with your speech. Look, come on, give me something. Tell me that my hair is out of place. Tell me my, that my glasses are crooked or tell me something. And we have to do it in a way that's fun. It's engaging. It's invigorating, such as table topics, 
Make your table topics fun. Again, Dr. Ralph Smedley, our founder, once said that we learn in times of fun and enjoyment. Some of our clubs have taken that out of the equation. And I'm going to put some of you on the spot. Some of you corporate club types. Well, we're professionals. We're not supposed to have fun. Well, let me tell you something. If you're not having fun, I will definitely not be a member of your club. I don't even want to come visit you because I'm going to think that the next hour of my life that I choose to be in your club is going to be boring. And I don't want to be bored one minute of any days out here. So make your club invigorating. And look, we're in a virtual world. Connect to your region Facebook page right now. Connect to your region Facebook page. Go visit other clubs if you're looking for really specific ideas and visit these clubs. There are, look, we're 350,000 members strong. We've got some very innovative ideas out there. Make it happen. Be mindful of every minute that you're in that club and ultimately have fun. Because if you're not having fun, what's the purpose of being there? And remember this, and I'm gonna leave you with this. Toastmasters is the ultimate team sport. All of you out there who know me know that I live by those words, team sport. We may be as successful as we could be in our minds, but remember, this is a team effort. So if one person is not pulling their weight or bringing the, the ship down, we all will go down together. But a team sport concept, have that in mind. And listen, guys, we're all in this together. And all of you leaders out there, make sure you are really leading and not just being a title holder because there's a stark difference. And my last thing, just do it. Have fun, live life to the fullest, and use this Toastmaster opportunity to take your life to the next level. Because at the end of the day, as my buddy Perry Neal would say, Toastmasters, we don't sell widgets, we don't sell bicycles, we don't make coffee or, or big bread. We sell confidence. Get confident and have fun. Thank you, Charles. John, can I jump in? Because all of, my, all of my meetings are not as fun as Toastmaster meetings. I can say that right now, just based on Charles. And so, you know, I hate to say it, but I don't think this virtual platform is going anywhere anytime soon. And so, again, my meetings aren't as fun. So I think about ways to engage my five senses during my meeting. So environmental modification is one that's a fancy word if i have to be in front of the computer all the time what can i do in my environment to make it more pleasurable to me can i change my seating can i do take the call outside can i do it in a different room what can i feel right we want to engage the five senses can i put my fuzzy pants on what can i smell can i have my favorite cup of coffee or burn a candle but i want to engage my senses through my environment you can stand you can sit so trying to switch it up if your meetings aren't as fun as Toastmaster meetings. Um, those are just some strategies to, to help with Zoom fatigue and, and the, the boring meetings. <laughs> and, and John, can I pick back off of what uh, Dr. Ali Carter just said? Some meetings of, of, are, are just innately boring. However, I think we need to, if now if you're, you're in a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two -on -two situation, that, that's a different story. But when there's a group of people, say five or six or more, there's no reason we can't tell stories in those meetings. And I'll make this very briefly, very brief. A NASA scientist came to me a few years ago and told me, Charles, you know what? I get briefings all the time. They're just statistically driven. They're data driven. They're boring. And I can see it on the faces of everyone. And I simply asked him, do you tell stories in your presentations? He says, I'm a professional. I don't tell stories. If you are in business, if you are in life, if you're not telling stories, you are missing out. Because look, think about it. why do we go to movies? Why do we read books? They're all stories. Become a good storyteller. Insert it strategically into your meetings and liven that meeting up. And there's no reason if there's three or more people, in my opinion, to have a boring meeting. I'm a business owner. I get it. All, if I don't tell stories in my, in my business meetings, they know Charles is not on his game. And I will never, ever do a meeting without it. That, that might be a burnout sign for you, Charles, when you're not telling stories. <laughs> a, a, couple of, a couple of things that I do, because I spend uh, a lot of every day in front of this screen, is that I have uh, aromatherapy in my room. And so when I, it's towards the end of the day, I put something really br uh, fresh and bright on, like sunshine. It's called sunshine or fir trees that really stimulate me and make me awake. And I also, one of the things that we do in our Toastmasters Club uh, meetings online 
is that, of course, the protocol is that we're muted when everything's going on. But when we have uh, humor in our club, we unmute so we can hear one another laugh. And it's amazing how special it is just to hear one another laugh. Uh, the other element that we do is have an a education section within our meeting. So three minutes is dedicated to somebody teaching something new on communication or leadership. And so that stimulates our thoughts. And I find that when I wanna go to a meeting, I say, Will I be disappointed? Will I miss something if I don't go? And if the answer is yes, then I know I'm in the right place in the right meeting. So I think that ask yourself, if you missed your meeting this week, would you miss something important and regret it? And if you wouldn't, then change. And I, Thanks, I'd John. Like to add one point to that and sort of flip the coin a little bit. For those who of you who are running meetings, to, to think about adult learners. Typically our attention span is at max about 20 minutes. And so when I'm teaching a class, I'll, I'll try to bring in a bunch of different modalities where I can show a little bit of a video clip. Um, and I call that a station break from me. Sometimes I'll have my students stand up and do a stretching exercise. We might do, we might have a pole without using the broom and, and you know, being able to, to do a pole exercise or kind of stretch. So I think depending upon the nature of your meeting and how formal it is or how brief it is, that you might find a way to kind of be attentive to the needs of adult learners to make sure that your message is heard and actionable and that people aren't zoning out because of, of Zoom, Zoom overload. I think thus it speaks to the demand also uh, for the stand-up desks that everybody's been buying <laughs> around the world, of which I have one. And John, could I just say this to, to piggyback off the of Dr. Brown's point really quick? Past world champ world champion speakers, Mark Brown and, and Darren LaCroix, who have a wonderful podcast, by the way. What they call what what you do in your meetings, Lisa Brown, and according to those two gentlemen, is called pace elements. It's breaking up the meeting as you go. No one wants to look at a talking head for a half hour, especially if they don't use vocal variety and they're not engaging and connecting with that audience. But if you throw in videos, you throw in those illustrations, you throw in polls, you throw in those little things that put them in breakout rooms. If you do those little things, it, it engages the people to be more inclusive in what's going on. So great point. I love the idea of, of changing things up that, that you all shared. And these companies have, have obviously caught on to that Even within Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever platform you're using. Uh, you can change your background. You can add little filters, give yourself a mustache. Uh, you, you can change the setting. Right now we see all of you sitting in, in sort of uh, Brady Bunch squares. Uh, but some of the platforms, I, I can put you into an, an auditorium format or sitting around a round table. Uh, just, just little changes like that seem to help. They certainly work for me. Uh, you all shared several strategies uh, for, for how to maintain resilience and, and, and avoid burnout. Uh, Pat, this question's for you. Uh, and this is from a Toastmasters member uh, about how to take that first step. And the question is about um, how do you work with members club officers who, whose clubs are so closed at this point and haven't taken that step to move to an online meeting format or, or, or to start the clubs again. But I suppose this, this question could be about anything in life. How do you encourage someone and motivate them to take that first step and, and to try something new? Thank, thanks for that question, John. Uh, for me, it is uh, recognizing, first of all, that I'm intrinsically motivated, excuse me, intrinsically motivated and have trouble with my tongue, teeth and lips sometimes. But uh, so because I'm self-driven and I've always got uh, something ahead that I'm planning, like somebody said to me, what are you going to do uh, next year? I said, oh, I, that's all planned. And the next year after that's already uh, set out. But I really uh, go back to Simon Sinek's basics of knowing your why, why you're doing something. And regardless if it's in your career, if it's your community activity, if it's your uh, family, if it's uh, education you're taking, if it's a Toastmaster meeting you're going to to improve yourself, you have to stay in touch and revisit frequently your why. 
So I've been in Toastmasters, many of you know this, 38 years. I know I joined when I was 15 and I have never lost track of my why. It has changed more than 38 times why I'm here and why I'm still here and why I plan to be here next year and the year after. But we need to do that self-awareness work. We need to connect like, like the, our doctors were saying that we're the ones that know us the best. And so what drives us? Uh, for me, it's that uh, knowing that I'm seen and that, that I can see me in, in this environment. It's uh, continuously learning, which satisfies my crazy brain. So I'm not just spinning, but I'm learning and processing and analyzing. So we need to identify what do we need to fulfill our highest and best purpose on earth? And then to seek that environment. And if it's in Toastmasters, fantastic. If it's being at the gym, get in touch with why you're doing it so that it's not rote, but it's conscious choice. And I think that's where joy in life comes from. From my, my experience is that I consciously choose and I know why. Not to just get on the treadmill uh, figuratively speaking, and just go and lose track of what am I doing? And, you know, there's an old saying that some people are dead, they just, we just haven't covered them over. And it's really important to be alive in your life, to be conscious, and make those conscious choices. And uh, again, back to the idea of really being in touch with your why. And may I ask you to not lie to yourself? Sometimes we go, oh, that wouldn't be what I would should be doing or should want. Yes, you should. You're unique. You're wonderful. Bring whatever you are and whoever you are to it and just be honest about it. So I'll let that go at that, John. Thanks. Thank you, Pat. This next question is for Dilip. An audience member is saying, that it's very disheartening sometimes to hear someone tell you, just be happy, just will it. it it's, it's your choice, just choose to be happy and, and deal with your situation. Uh, when the reality is uh, struggles vary, uh, either, either within a person over time or, or person, person by person. Uh, what, what do you do when you, when you can't just choose to be happy? Uh, and and that, that strategy just isn't, isn't working for you. How do you handle that? You mute, muted Dilip. Thank you. What I found most helpful for me, and I can't necessarily speak for everyone else, but I found this to always work. Think about what I'm grateful for. Think about what I'm grateful for. And when I'm in a state of gratitude, happiness just follows. Don't seek after happiness but seek after joy. <laughs> and what I'm, you know, there's this, the, the notion which comes from the Declaration of Independence that we should pursue happiness. I found that that can be a dead end sometimes, but seek for that which you are grateful for. When I sit back quietly in my easy chair and think about how grateful I am for my wife, for my children, for my grandchildren, for having meaningful work, for having another day, for my Toastmaster family. And I can go on and on and on. And before I know it, I'm in a state of happiness, but not because I chased after it, but because I, I focused on the things that have been given to me, not because of my own greatness or cleverness, but they are gifts of grace that life has given me. And with my, with my religious background, they are really, they emanate from a strong faith in a power that is much greater than I am and that I'm the recipient of so many gifts. And so it's easy to smile and easy to feel, why me? It's not because I deserved it. It's because I have received the, the grace of God, the grace of other people, opportunities that 
never would have come my way if not for the love and care of others. And then I find, how can I not be happy? It's not what I have, it's what I have received. And it makes me want to give back. Thank you, Dilip. Thank you everyone for today. Uh, I, I can't believe how quickly the time went by. The 90 minutes are, are already over. Uh, thank you, Dilip. Thank you, Mana, Lisa, Charles, and Pat for spending your time with us today. Uh, I am confident that the audience appreciates it as well. We will be sending the recording link of today's webinar to everyone who registered. Uh, please feel free to send it to friends and colleagues who you think will benefit from it. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful day.